Okay, let's uh, continue. Just one more administrative detail. Does this class also go till 45 or to 45? Okay, good. <clears throat> All right, open your Bibles, please, to Jeremiah chapter 31. Yes, I know that's not in Exodus. Okay, I just wanted, I realized during the break that I mentioned a few passages of scripture that uh, I felt it would, be, it would be wise and appropriate for us to actually look at them. So Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the old covenant, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will write my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I shall be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Okay, stop there. What translation do you use? I read from the New American Standard Translation. Yes. Okay, so that's the New Covenant mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 31. Now turn, please, to Luke chapter 22. This is the uh, Last Supper, as we call it. Again, that's not a biblical term. Just as Lord's Supper is not a biblical term, Last, summer's, last Supper is not a biblical term, but it's not a big deal. It's appropriate to use it, but it's not stated that way in Scripture. This is the Passover that Jesus is having. You know, he had four Passovers with his apostles. See, how long was Jesus' ministry on earth? approximately three years, he started on a Passover. Now, we could look at that, but that's not what we're here to do. He started on a Passover. Now, when you looked at the feasts last week, did you see that there is an annual cycle of feasts and they occur the same time every year? Okay. So he started on a Passover, and he went one year to another Passover. And then he went a second year to another Passover. And then he went a third year to another Passover. And on this Passover, he died. So he had four Passovers in his ministry. In his three years of ministry, he had four Passovers with his, maybe with his apostles. He had some apostles by the time he began his first Passover. By the time his first Passover with his first Passover in his ministry. So four Passovers, is that a big deal? Not necessarily, but as Bible students, it's helpful to understand as much as we can and then to continue to understand more and more. He started his mini ministry on a Passover and he finished his ministry on a Passover. Okay, so this is his last Passover, Luke chapter twenty two. Verse 14, when the hour had come, the hour of the, verse 13, they departed and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. 
When the hour had come, he reclined at the table with the apostles and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So he's telling them that I wanted to have this Passover before I suffer, and tomorrow I'm suffering. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Now that's not the cup that he drank for the, what we call communion. That's just one of the cups. There are four cups in the Passover. That's actually the first cup. Verse 19, when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Stop there. The new covenant. Now, if the apostles were students of the scriptures and had paid attention to Jeremiah, when he lifted and said, This, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, he was saying to them, I am establishing the covenant I'm finishing the Mosaic Covenant and I am establishing the New Covenant that Jeremiah told us about because that's what we just read in Jeremiah. Okay, I just wanted to show you the passages. Now I'd like to show you another passage um, in John chapter 14, please, because I mentioned this as well. John chapter 14, this is also that final Passover that he had with his apostles. It's the same context. By the way, last week, you studied feasts. I mean, I keep saying that. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. Okay, you studied the feasts. There are seven feasts, annual feasts. In the Gospel of John, which you guys are studying, were you just in John this past hour or Luke? Luke? Luke, okay. In the Gospel of John, in John chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, I know I did this before with Exodus, John chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, and really you can go even farther. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 chapters. Now, how many chapters are in the Gospel of John? Twenty-one. Ten of the twenty-one chapters are in the context of the feasts that you studied last week. You see the significance of that, having done that last week? Ten of the 21 chapters of John are in the context of the feasts. Did you study the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths? You at least being introduced to it. This, this, these chapters are all in the context of the Feast of Booths. These chapters are all in the context of the Passover. So, so 10 of 21, that's almost 50% of John is in the context of the feasts. You want to understand John? Do you think it behooves us? to understand the feasts a little, since almost 50% of it is in the context of the feasts. Okay, John chapter 14. I mentioned this to you and I wanted to read it to you. Verse one, in the feast, let not your heart be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. Stop there. You see? That's the Jewish wedding system. I go to prepare a place, and then he said, if I go, guess what? I'm also coming back to get you as my bride. That's the context of that. And then one more passage we talked about but we didn't read is Matthew chapter 1. So let's just do that. (laughs) 
Just one verse. Matthew chapter 1. Just one verse. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Stop there. Now, if you didn't pay any attention to your Old Testament, would you know who Abraham is? If you didn't pay any attention to your Old Testament, would you know who David is? Who is David, by the way? Second king of Israel. That's his identity. That is extremely significant. David was the second king of Israel. From what tribe was David? You know the tribes, 12 tribes? Judah. We may go into Genesis and look at something that was told to Judah, his ancestor. But David was the second king of Israel. Jesus is the son of David. What did it say on the cross? King of the Jews. King of the Jews. Just like David. You see how it connects? Okay. Now let's dive into Exodus a little. Anybody have any thoughts or questions about anything? Yes. Um, you're talking like, um, the, like the Lord's Supper and the different things that kind of Christians have came up with terms for that aren't actually in Scripture. Yeah. Is uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb, is that in Scripture? Is that, that is. Okay. That is. The marriage supper of the Lamb. You want to see it? Sure. Revelation chapter 19. Turn to Revelation 19. We'll show you the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's not technically, well, you know, Nick, it's not technically what it's called. It is technically what it's called. Revelation chapter 19. This is, I don't know if you guys have ever studied Revelation. You know, in Revelation, by the way, just so you know, because we still have, this is only our second class, we still have a few classes to go. Just so you know, I am comfortable with questions like this that have technically nothing to do with Exodus, but in my opinion, totally are connected to Exodus. I'm comfortable with going in a different direction as long as the direction we go is biblical. Just to kind of wander around and chat, I'm not going to spend time on that. But as long as where we're going is biblical, since I am absolutely convinced, as John Enns is and as Matty is, that it's one story, I'm totally convinced of that, then I'm comfortable going anywhere in Scripture because I believe it's all connected. Matthew 19 is at the end, Matthew, Revelation 19 is at the end of, do you, do you know the term Great Tribulation? Yes. You ever heard of it? It's a time of suffering on earth, a seven-year time of suffering like never has been seen on earth and never will be seen again. And there are purposes for the tribulation, but we're not going to discuss those. There are three primary purposes that I see. But in the tribulation, and by the way, Revelation is not a complicated book. It's not. In, in the tribulation, there are three series of judgments. The seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. Three series of judgments on the earth. Seals, trumpets, and bowls. When we come to the end of the bowl judgments, we are coming to the end of time. Be, not the full end of time, but we're coming to the end of that time of suffering. At the end of that time of suffering, we come to Revelation 19, okay? Go to verse 1. After these things, I heard, as it were, a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Belong to our God. Because his judgments, the judgments of the tribulation, are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot, who is, is judged in chapter 17 and 18. He has judged the great harlot, who is corrupting the earth with her immorality. And he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah, 
Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down. They are introduced to us in chapter 4. They fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen of the righteous is the righteous acts of the saints. He said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these words are true words of God. Okay, does that answer your question, Nick? Yes. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? Okay, I took you to Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, but I think we didn't read it. Am I right? We did read it? Okay, good. Oh, right, we're now heading to, to Exodus. So anything else before we go to Exodus? Okay, I want to show you something. I'm gonna, we're going to read a series of verses. Turn to chapter 2, please. We're going to read a series of verses... I'm going to ask you what what do these verses what do these verses have in common? A series of verses. Chapter 2, verse 23. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. They cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel and God took notice of them. Stop there, please. Go to chapter 3, verse 6. This is God speaking to Moses at the bush. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Now verse 15, chapter 3. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name. Forever, this is my memorial name to all generations. Turn to, go to verse 16. One more verse. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. Chapter 4. Verse 5. Go to verse 4. But the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. That's a snake. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Chapter 6. Verse 2. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Verse 8. I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for possession. I am the Lord. And go all the way forward to chapter, well, just a moment. All the way to chapter 33. Chapter 33. Verse 1. 
Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it. Stop there, please. Okay. What did you see? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What is the deal? Did you all see that? Also, the declaring the name of the Lord. Also, yeah, him declaring that he is Lord of the world. Is that? You, like he says that, like the Lord of. Uh, Ab- uh, Lord, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. yeah, definitely. He's the Lord of them all. He's making a covenant with them. He's making one? When? He made one. He made one. He made one. And so, brethren, what's happening in Exodus is completely based on his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, how many times did we see it? How many times did he mention their names? I read it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times. And there are a couple of others that I didn't read that don't specifically say their names, just refer to them. And I probably have missed some. What's happening in Exodus is totally based on a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So in order for us to understand Exodus, we need to understand that covenant. What covenant are we talking about? We've already talked about the Mosaic Covenant, right? Right? We mentioned the Mosaic Covenant. How many commandments does it have? 613. Then we talked about what other covenant? The new covenant, which, by the way, brethren, we're in that. When you came to believe in Jesus, you signed on the dotted line of the new covenant. That's your covenant. You're in. You're in a covenantal relationship with God. It's called the new covenant. You're in. And that's worthy of quite an extended study as well. Everything is. Okay, so what covenant are we talking about? He, it's the one he gave to him in the land of Canaan? Yeah. Is that what you said? I said, is it the one that he established to, to give them the land of Canaan? Yes, yes, yes. To give, who's them? That's correct. That's exactly correct. When you see those terms, when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, think Abrahamic covenant. Abrahamic covenant. That's what the covenant is called. Abrahamic. Now truthfully, I don't even know if that's a biblical term. It's used by scholars throughout. I don't even know if that is technically a biblical term. But if we want to understand Exodus, in fact, brethren, I would say if you want to understand Jesus, you need to understand the Abrahamic covenant. So let's take a look at the Abrahamic covenant. If we wanted to look at it, where would we go? Genesis. Where in Genesis? Well, remember, where was Abraham introduced? Chapter 11. So chapter 12 is where we would find the Abrahamic covenant. Chapter 15 is called the Abrahamic covenant. Yes, chapter 15 is where God and Abraham are having a discussion. Because, God, it's been quite a few years since you made this promise to me in chapter 12. I still don't have my son. So turn to chapter 12. You want to know the context of your Bible, how it's one story? This is it. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, so his name is still Abram, 
Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Stop there. Okay. We're going to look at this in some detail. Okay. We're not going to cover every particular detail, but we're going to look at it in some detail. So again, verse 1, go forth from your country and from your relatives. By the way, where was Abram from? Ur. Ur. What's Ur? Anybody know what Ur is? Pardon? Where is Ur? Of the, Ur of the Chaldees. Ur of the Chaldees. Chaldea. Okay, where is Chaldea? Ur is a region. Chaldea is a nation, a country. Where is Chaldea? You know it by a different name would be my guess. It starts with a B. What? Babylon. Babylon. Abram was Babylonian. You've heard of Babylon? You know, it came from the Tower of Babel. And Babylon, in fact, we even read Babylon in Revelation 19. Babylon's part of history, right from the Tower of Babel, which is chapter 11 of Genesis, all the way through Revelation 19. Babylon is part of history. Today, it's modern-day Iraq. It's Babylon. It's part of history from from. Genesis chapter 11, all the way through Revelation 19, Babylon. Abram's from there. Abram was a pagan. Wasn't everybody from there in Babylon? Not by Abram's time. People had spread out, yeah. But it's a, a good thought, because that's kind of the where mankind was planted. Abram was a pagan idol worshiper. You got that? He was a pagan idol worshiper. He worshiped things like music stands. People still do, you know. People worship pieces of metal. Just go to India and you'll see. I've been in stores in India where they have a line. Here's the counter. Here's here's the, the, the counter. And a man comes in and he says, I'll take that one. And the guy takes down an idol a piece of metal that's maybe this size and it's shiny gold but it's just gold plated and he takes one off and sells it to this man and there are a whole bunch more behind it and over here are the silver ones and over here are the other ones and the other ones and the other ones I've been in stores in India just like this and they buy these and he takes it home and he sets up an altar to it and he worships it every morning with his family Today, that's over a billion people in India do that. Might seem foreign to us from here, but people worship things like music stands. And Abram was one of them. So what qualified Abram to be, to receive what we're about to look at? Yeah. God's choice. Had nothing to do with Abram. It's not that Abraham was so qual- Abram was so qualified. It's God's choice. Okay. All right. So Abram, come from the land which I come from your your home, your father father's relatives, your country, your father's relatives, your father's house to the land which I will show you. Okay. Now I'm going to start showing you the Abrahamic covenant. Part one is land to the land which I will show you. Okay. Let's keep going. And I will make you a great nation. I will make you a great nation. And now we're going to read some and just focus in on the last two. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. Make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. I will bless those who bless you. And the one who, I'm sorry? Gesundheit. Gesundheit. And I will curse those who curse you. 
right? We just read it, right? And then the last one, which has been referred to to us this morning already by Alexis. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So in you, Abram, you pagan, Babylonian, idol worshiper, in you, I'm going to bless everyone. Is that fair? Brethren, is that fair? Okay, now let's look at this. <clears throat> if I ask you what's a fulcrum, what would you tell me? Fulcrum. Point of balance on which everything balances. So if I drew this and I have zero artistic ability, if I drew this, some people call it a teeter totter. I grew up calling it a seesaw. That's the fulcrum right there. Everything balances right there. Brethren, your Bible balances right here. Everything in your Bible balances right here. Okay, now, go to the land which I will show you. What do we call that land? What's the term we use? Promised. That's the promised land. The reason we call it the promised land is because God promised it to Abram. And then, Abram, I'm going to make you a great nation. What does that mean? You're going to have children. How many? So many. So many. Look up there. Can you count them? That's how many you're going to have. Okay? That's this part of it, and that's correct. That's this part of it. What about this part of it? The make part of it. Not by your abilities. In other words, you can't do it, Abram, but I will. Build this out a little bit. Creating He's creating something. What does that imply? It didn't exist, right? Abram, I'm going to make a nation that doesn't exist. OK, so you got that? Didn't exist. I'm going to make a new nation, a new race of people that didn't exist before. Okay? Now, here's what I'm going to do with this race of people, Abram. I'm going to bless those who bless you and your race, and I'm going to curse those who curse you and your race. What does that mean? In your words. His favor will be on who? Sorry, his entire family. God's favor will be on <coughs> Abraham and his entire family. Yes, yes. Build it out. Okay. All right. So justice, certainly bless who blesses, curse who curses, okay. Um, like those who follow will be saved in the bigger picture. Okay. That's more down here. I'm gonna bless those who bless you, I'm gonna curse those who curse you. Abram. Okay, we have to finalize our definition before I can answer that question. We have to define this. It's a fair question, but we have to define this first. We have to understand this. How about these words? Tell me if this is fair. How people treat you is how I will treat them. 
Is that fair? How pre people treat you is how I will treat them. Is that fair? Okay, good. Now this is God saying that, which means God can do it. So, Abram, how people treat you, I'm going to watch. I'm going to see how they treat you. And how they treat you is how I'm going to treat them. Yes? Is he talking about that's how he'll treat them while they're also on earth? Or is this going to come from the present? No, this is while they're on earth. Is that your question? Whether they're on earth? Yeah, this is on earth. It starts right away. And if we pay attention to it, we can see this lived out in the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We can see that principle lived out. How people treat them, they get treated the same way. Not all, even into the kings we see the same thing happen. How people treat them, even into the prophets we see the same thing. How people treat Israel is how God treats them. So tell me, what does this do for Abraham? Does that make it easy for him to blend in? He will be distinct from everybody on earth. Sore thumb. Isn't that making Abram distinct? Is it? Yeah. Totally distinct. How, um, Abram, you stand here. I'm going to watch everybody. <laughs> and how everybody, now who's the everybody? Everybody but? But Israel. But Israel. I'm going to watch everyone in the world and how they treat you is how I'm going to treat them. Yeah. That's going to keep... Leading up to this moment. Which responds to that question. We're going to... No, to that No, that question, yeah. And a little bit your question as well. So it keeps Israel totally distinct is what it does. Right? Okay? Now let's just go back and revisit. Are we talking about just Abram? We're talking about what? A great nation. And are they going to be easy to find? Is it going to be easy for God to see where they are and for everyone else to see where they are, to keep them separate and distinct? How's that going to be easy? Everyone's going to know. That's because... They're going to be in the land. You see the promise? You see the plan? And we haven't gotten to this yet. We haven't gotten to this, the bottom. Okay, so Abram, come here. Leave Babylon and come and live in this land that I'm giving to you. And I know, I know, you don't have any children yet. You're 99 when Isaac is born. Or 100 when Isaac is born. You'll be 99 when Sarah finally becomes pregnant. You're going to be 100 when Isaac is born. Sarah's going to be 90 when Isaac is born. And then you're going to become a great nation. I'm going to stick you right there. I'm going to place you right there. And by the way, Jerusalem, if you were, if you were to take the globe and just kind of cut it open and lay it flat, you find Israel right in the middle of the globe. It's geographically the center of the world, interestingly. So you're going to be right here, and everybody's going to be able to find you, and it doesn't matter what you try to do, you can't blend in. You can never be like them. You can try. You'll never succeed, Abram. I'm keeping you separate. This is my plan to keep you separate. And I'm going to watch. And how people treat you is how I'm going to treat them. Because through you, Abram, I'm going, to bless, I'm going to bless everyone. Now, brethren, we have jumped quite a bit forward. To come to, to start in Genesis 12 is quite a leap forward. We didn't look at Genesis 1, 2, and 3. It's a big jump forward. So since you've looked at Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you can answer this question. What is the blessing that everybody needs? Redemption from sin. Salvation. Redemption from sin. Why? What happened? 
you know. I'm sure you know the answer. What happened? Uh, Adam and Eve sinned. Adam and Eve sinned. And in the day they ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happened? That's not what God said would happen. What did God say would happen? The day you eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. And they were. They were dead. Right? I mean, Adam and Eve, what separated Adam and Eve before they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It's a trick question. What separated them? Nothing. Nothing separated them. What separated them as soon as they ate? Fig leaves. You want to know the definition of death? The day you eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. You want to know the definition of death? Pardon? No, but that's part of it. The definition is, I, I'm sorry again, I wish I had a larger whiteboard. Rick's, Rick's trying, he's trying. The definition of death is separation. In the day you eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. I have seen a number of my family members die. I've been there when a number of my family members have died. So I'll tell you about my mother. We're running out of time. I was there when my mother was breathing her last breath. My mother came to Christ at 89 years old eight weeks before she died. I prayed for her for 30 years. I never knew if I should get discouraged or not. <laughs> she came to Christ, 89, eight weeks before she died. And I'm with her, and she's, she's laying there. And she's, when somebody dies, I don't know if you've been there with somebody who's dying slowly, not traumatically, but slowly, she, they go, they take a breath in, they go, <sighs> They breathe out. And so my mother, she'd go, and I'd say, OK, Mommy, you're still here. I called her Mommy. You're still here, but soon you're going to heaven. And this is so great, because you're going to be out of this body that is really a problem for you. And you're going to be in the presence of Jesus. You're going to see Daddy. But more especially, you're going to see Jesus. You're going to see Yeshua, is what I called him. And maybe the guy last week mentioned that name as well. You're going to see Yeshua. And it's so good. And she's, and then, then I'd wait, and I'd wait to see if she breathes in. <sighs> she breathes in again. OK, so you're still here. And it's fine that you're still here, but you're going to go. It's clear you're going to leave soon. And this is going to be so wonderful. And I'm going to see you eventually. And Pat, you'll see you. And all, these, all my children are going to see you. This is great, Mommy. And I'm talking. And I'm encouraging her in Christ. And she, she breathes out. And I wait. And I wait. And I wait. And she doesn't breathe in again. She's dead. Did I talk to her anymore? No. You know why? Not She's not there. Who are you going to talk to? She's gone. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Thankfully, eight weeks earlier, she came to Christ. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been absent from the body, present with the Lord. Her human spirit separated from her human body. That's the definition of death, separation. What was between Adam and Eve before they ate? Nothing. What was between Adam and Eve after they ate? Fig leaves. They were dead. Death had entered between the two, two of them. And then when God comes into the garden, where do they go? Behind the tree. They hide. What does that communicate? Shame. Shame. Separation. Separation. They're dead. They're not only dead from each other, they're dead from God. They are spiritually dead. Now here's the key question, brethren. What are they going to do about it? They can't do anything. A dead person can't save himself. They needed help. But we have to stop. So we'll pick up there at 4 o'clock. Well, you know the answers, so you're in good shape. You've already studied it. You're welcome.